Okay, so today we will be discussing, sort of, discussing Dead House Gates, which is the second Malazan book, followed by Gardens of the Moon. I have a very, very messy review of Gardens of the Moon, which I will link up high and in the description, but also this is going to be even more messy. So basically, I was trying to, I was trying to work out some notes for this review, just some talking points, some things I want to hit, and I realized that I don't think that I can give a proper comprehensive review of this book. I don't think it's possible to do it unless you've read the entire series a couple of times. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you my overall thoughts of the book as a whole as well as hit a couple of key really important characters and scenes that have stood out to me a lot. I read Dead House Gates for almost two months. I think I had it ongoing, and that's not for lack of enjoyment. I enjoyed this book so much. I love Erickson's writing and his storytelling. He, I've never read a series that has gone over my head to the level that this does, but at the same time feels very, very intentional. There's so many things that are being thrown at me in this series, in these two books so far, that sometimes feel like a wild card. I mean, truly, there are some scenes that feel like they've come out of nowhere and it feels like it feels convenient sometimes, but at the same time, there are so many things that feel absolutely um, intentional and thought out, and I can tell that all these different threads that I can't keep track of, I can tell that Erickson is keeping track of them and that, you know, reveals are already happening. Things are already starting to connect and unfold just within the second book. So I have a lot of faith in the things that I don't understand in them coming together. Am I going to understand them as they come together? I guess we'll see. But it is a very confusing story. I've never read a story that has, that in so many different places, I've just kind of thrown up my hands and said, it's okay that I don't get this. <laughs> um, I'm definitely, as I'm reading through this series, I'm holding on to it very loosely, and I definitely said that a lot, especially at the beginning of reading Wheel of Time as well, but this is a whole new level. <laughs> There's a lot of things that I'm reading that I'm holding on to very loosely, the different characters that we meet and the interactions that they have, but pri primarily in the world, in describing different gods and the different layers of the politics of everything that's happening here. Um, a lot of it, some of it I'm hanging on to, but a lot of it I'm just holding on to loosely and I'm saying, I'm not even going to try to understand this. I'm not even going to try to wrap my head around it. I expect it all to come together eventually. I really love Erickson's prose. I've, I made the comparison to Abercrombie in my Gardens of the Moon review, and I stand by that even more now. Uh, I love, I love Erickson's very, um, brutally honest storytelling. When he describes horrific scenes, I really love, man, this is hard. So there are, oh, this is all spoiler filled, by the way. Um, I guess I'm still spoiler free now. So do I want to say something spoiler free? My spoiler free thoughts of this book are it was brutal. It was very hard to read. It was heavy on my heart while I was reading it, but it was also, like, it was so good. There wasn't a moment that I I, I, despite being overwhelmed and despite being sad for so much of the book, there wasn't a moment that I wanted to put it down. I loved reading it. I just had to take it slow because it was so heavy to read. Spoiler free. There you go. Now let's talk spoilers. So with Abercrombie and with Erickson, so Erickson describes these, these terribly brutal scenes. Uh, this is a horribly brutal world that we're living in. And I definitely think that book two upped that brutality on a level that I didn't expect. I mean, book one was very dark as well, uh, but book two, I think, surpassed that by a landslide and how dark it went with both the story, this, this, the, the characters' stories that we were following, but as well in the world itself. And, and, Erickson has this way of describing these horribly brutal events in a way that's very removed. He'll he'll tell you exactly what happens, and I never feel like he revels in it. There's a lot of books that I've read that that go grimdark that are that really revel in 
the in the sickening things that are happening. They really want to rub your nose in it and shove it down your throat, and I hate that. To me, it feels too much like you're trying to shock me and too much like you're trying to you're trying too hard to make your world look dark. Whereas with Erickson and Abercrombie, the way that they write, it's a lot more of here's just a brutally honest depiction of something that happened. And and that's the end of it. They give you the exact amount of information you need. They don't revel in it, but they also don't try to add their morality to anything. One thing in particular, well, there's a lot of things that I could talk about in in this, in, in what I'm talking about here, but one thing I think that hit me the hardest is Felicen's story, which was just so painful for me to read. Um, but with, with everything that happened to Felicen, I never felt like Erickson... Um, I, I feel like Eric, Erickson handled it tactically, tact, tactfully for the most part, where he, again, he didn't make me rebel and he didn't rub my nose in the things that happened to her, but he also didn't hold back in telling me what happened to her. But at the same time, he didn't moralize things. He didn't, he didn't, he wasn't in the background, the author saying, this is bad, guys, or or trying, he wasn't trying to influence how I feel about Felicen as a character or about the things that happened to her. He trusts me as a reader to figure, to figure out on my own how I want to feel. And that's my favorite way of writing in a general way, but if you're writing something as dark as this story has gone, I really appreciate that type of writing. I always feel guilty comparing authors, especially one of my favorite authors like Joe Abercrombie. I feel really guilty comparing authors because it's not fair because every author has their own style. But the more I read of Erickson, the more I feel like his writing reminds me so much of Abercrombie in very key ways. And I will bring that up again later when I talk about a couple of specific things. So my overall thoughts of the story uh, is... is I, I enjoyed myself, enjoyed is the wrong word. I never, I, I, I appreciate Erickson's writing so much and I enjoyed is the wrong word, but I don't know what else to say here. I enjoyed reading Dead House Gates from beginning to end, but it was so heavy and it was so dark that I could only read it in small chunks. Like I'd, I'd read a little bit and then I'd go read something else. And then I'd read a little bit and then I'd go read something else because it it, 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 it weighed heavy on my heart. I mean, it depressed me at times. It legitimately depressed me to read some of the scenes that I read. And I think, that's, I, I think that he did a great job writing them. And I appreciate his storytelling style so much. I think he fits me really well, except for his world building is too expansive for me and too confusing for me, but that doesn't bother me that much. I read a lot of authors that love their world building a lot, so it's fine. I've emphasized a lot here how dark I found, I found this story, but I also want to compliment it with how much humor was still allowed to exist here, uh, which is something that I think is a really important balance to hit. Not just humor, but, um, well, I guess there's, there's a lot going on in the world that allows us to breathe, whether it be this really overwhelming, crazy scene that I'm, that breaks my brain, or if it is something that's, that's funny and lighthearted that goes along with it. I can't for the life of me find my copy of Dead House Gates. I was gonna read a scene to you to illustrate what I'm talking about, but I don't know where the book is. I maybe just hit it somewhere after I finished the book because I was so sad. Uh, but that's fine. I'm talking about the scene. I don't even remember the character's name. I'm talking about the scene where there was a character who is surrounded by these undead creatures who are very mopey. And there's this character that's just hilarious. That's kind of like, that's, that's in charge of this undead army. And, and there's this scene where, where he's snapping at his undead army. He doesn't want them to tell their stories. One of them starts saying how he died and he's like, shut up, shut up. And he's like, he's constantly snapping at his undead, mopey, whiny army, which I, I guess they deserve their disposition. But uh, if I rem if I can find my book in time of when I'm editing this, I'll put this the scene on the screen so that because that was a terrible description of it. But there are there are scenes that I actually in the in the midst of my disparity, I have to stop to just laugh because it's so funny and fun. 
some of the things that he puts into the story. Along with that, there's so many creatures in the story that fascinate me, like this entire army that I just referenced. But then as well, there's a point where we where we we go through um, a wavern, a warren, not a wavern. We go through this warren, and and we and we end up on this ship that's being pushed by by corpses. And there's so many things that happen in this world filled with creatures and oddities that. I still can't fully wrap my head around, but that I love his descriptions of. I love the way he, when we go through these portals, when we go through these warrens, I love, I love the different things that we see and how confusing and chaotic and exciting it is. Uh, there was one point where they summoned a god and I don't even know what happened in that scene, but it was interesting to read. <laughs> yes, I guess Erickson, especially in this book, but in general, it seems, is very, very focused on his characters and I'm very much a character character reader. So uh, the slow pace, I mean, part of it is because we did a big old journey through the desert for a lot of this book. And I, I've mentioned this in other videos, I love going through the desert as, as a plot line in books, trying to survive in such a desperately hopeless terrain is so fascinating to me. Having to portion your food and portion your water and, and the extremely cold nights and the extremely hot days, the mirages, like all the different things that come along with traveling through the desert and the hopelessness of when will we get to the other side is for whatever reason, a type of travel story that fascinates me. Um, and this this apocalypse book that they're that they're traveling through the desert to deliver is also very fascinating to me. Uh, but plus, we just got a lot of really, really deep character moments where I feel like I got to know characters very, very well. But that's not always in this book. This book was, there was a lot happening here. We followed a lot of different groups of people and it was a lot to keep track of. So I'm just going to highlight some of my favorite characters and some of my favorite scenes, even though I've already kind of been highlighting some scenes that I really like, and then we'll call it a day. A character that I'm just now realizing I don't actually know the name of because in my mind I call him Coltrane, but I know that's not it. Is it Coltane? I've, I call him Coltrane in my mind. Coltrane is a character that I'm crazy interested in, uh, in his whole plot line with the Wiccans and everything that happened with him. Fascinating character, powerhouse, um, and very tactically wise. I loved his story from start to finish. Um, Ikarium and Mappo are easily some of my favorite characters. I mean, I'm predictable in that I'm, I'm a huge fan of reading very close friendships and their friendship I think is just so beautiful to read. Ikariam's incredibly interesting from the start with his whole thing of he hates killing animals, but he does. And when he does, he loses pieces of his memory. Am I, I mean, did I understand that correctly? And then Mappo, who seems to have an excess of memories and loves discussing them, uh, their back and forth and their, their camaraderie, their loyalty to each other just was so moving to me. Um, and then uh, when we finally learn more about their backstory and man, there was, there were, there were scenes with these two that just really, oh, got me. That I, for me, they, they were a bright spot in this story. I loved the way, I, I loved these two together so much. Kalam is a character I loved, another powerhouse, another crazy powerful guy. I especially love the scene when this group of people were saying, we're gonna go pillage and rape this village. And he was like, yeah, let's do it. He was going along with it, only to then turn on them all and slaughter them instead, with effortlessly, without breaking a sweat. Kalam, ooh, ooh, I loved his character. And Felicen. Felicen is the other one that I, oh, I latched onto her from the second I met her. Um, she has been through so much. I mean, she's a 15 year old girl that has been both sexually abused and, um, and, and mentally abused. She uh, has Stockholm syndrome from the man who mistreated her. She had so many terrible things happen to her, like when she had to like bury herself in the mud to fight off the swarm of bugs, but so many other things. It just like she could not catch a break every single step of the way. More horrible things were happening to her, even when she's on the journey and she was a total brat. I submit to you that a total brat to the people that are trying to rescue her and to like, shepherd her across the way, 
they were terrible to her too. Uh, what was that scene when they were when they were blaming her for a death? Yeah, Bennett is dead. And then uh, Bowden and Hibrook, I don't know how to say their names, they're basically rubbing her face in it. I mean, she sucks. <laughs> I remember the scene when she's all wet and uh, and and they're like, Felice, and don't, don't use those blankets. We need those tonight. And she's like, well, I need them right now. So, and she, she gets them all wet. And she, she, listen, I have so many feelings about her. Not only, she's recovering from a drug addiction at this point. She got hooked on drugs and she's like, she's dealing with a lot recovering from that or or trying to break uh, her hold with that. I'm so articulate today. I have a lot of feelings about her. I mean, she's a 15 year old kid who's been through all the violence and abuse and being used that she has. She is now using her body to, um, to protect herself and to protect her friends. And then those friends basically treat her like it, it, it doesn't matter, like it was use, like it, like it's not. She didn't really do anything for them, and I understand their frustration with her because she definitely acts like a spoiled brat. But my golly, can you blame her? She's a little kid. I mean, fifteen isn't a little kid, but she's a kid who who has been through so much. She's got so much. I mean. All I'm saying is when kids deal with some severe trauma like she has, they oftentimes turn bratty uh, as a defense and as a mechanism because their brains can't process everything that's just happened to them. And I feel like, I feel like I get her. I feel like I understand her. And when I see her making terrible decisions and, and turning on people and not trusting people, I mean, like, there's so many instances where it's like, these people are trying to save you. Please don't turn on them. Please just trust them. But at the same time, I think, I think that she was written so well. I think she was written like a 15 year old that's dealt with some severe trauma and doesn't trust anyone around her. And I can't blame her for not trusting anyone around her. After everything, she's been through, I can't blame her for thinking that the world is out to get her and for not... I can't blame her! I feel like I see her her brattiness and what I see is someone who's dealing with trauma. What I see is someone that's hurting so, 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 so much that she just lashes out at everyone. And, and when I see her not trusting people that are clearly helping her, all I see is someone that's so damaged that trust isn't even in her vocabulary anymore. She's a kid and the stuff that she's seen. I mean, even her internal voice, even the way she sees the world, she does not act like a kid. She doesn't think like a kid. She thinks like a war-torn soldier. She thinks like someone who's seen stuff, and she has. She seems so tired and weary, and I imagine she is. And, and there are so many scenes that I'm like, come on, Felisa, and you're not helping yourself. But at the same time, what I'm really seeing is just a really broken kid and it hurts me so much and I'm 1000% on her side. <laughs> I don't even know. I mean, I talked to Andy about this, which if you, if you don't know Andy, I'm, I'm going to link two of my, my friends here uh, on booktube who, who are huge fans of the series, Andy and Brittany. Um, but I was talking to my friend Andy and I was like, I don't know how the fandom feels about Felicen, but I would die for her. I will, I will defend her to my dying breath. And he, he told me the fandom is very split on her, so have at it. But from my limited knowledge, from where I stand right now, all I see is a traumatized kid that is very broken and acting broken. And I just wanna wrap her in a blanket and protect her from the world. Uh, let's get back to plot points because these are all of my main characters that I love and adore. Um, back to plot points. Uh, I, <laughs> okay, another, another reason why I really like to compare Erickson and Abercrombie is this whole plot line with traveling across the continent to deliver this apocalypse book. And then the second, what's her name? Shaik? The second we hand the book over to Shaik, she's killed. And Abercrombie does this too, where he will give us this big, thing, this big thing that we follow and we're trying to do something with these characters. And then once we get there, it's like, that was it? Why did we do this? What now? 
And I actually love that because it feels so real to me because at, at the end of every journey is not a victory. And I really love when authors will take you through this thing and you finally got to the checkpoint that you've been waiting for and you get there and it's a ho it's hollow. You get there and it's nothing. And you're like, why did we do this? But I love that feeling when I'm reading books. As long as it comes back around, as long as, as long as we go somewhere from there. I love that feeling when I'm reading books of like, oh, that's not what I thought was gonna happen here. What, what could we possibly, where could we go from here? And the answer is some sort of resurrection that causes a whirlwind that, that, that changes everything. So I think Felicen is maybe now Shaik resurrected, if I understood that correctly. And I'll be honest with you, I don't know that I did, but I think she is. And I don't know all the connotations that go with that. You know, I, it's another one of those things where it's like, I think I get what's happening, but maybe I don't. It's fine. I'll wait and see how it pans out. But anyway, a lot of little scenes happen throughout this book that I found fascinating. Oh, you know what? I should also probably mention the big aha moment of the story. At least for me, it was a big aha. And that's that was the ascendancy of Dancer and the other. <laughs> um, this was one of those things that when it was revealed in this book, I it, it was it was very satisfying to me because I didn't see it coming, but I feel like I should have. And those are my favorite kind of reveals when it's like, when it's like I, it, things come together in a way that I can now look back and see a lot of the seeds that were planted, like the bodies were never found. And, you know, um, a, lot of, a lot of small little things in book one, but book one was too chaotic for me to try to piece things together. So when it comes together in book two, I'm like, oh, that's what you were doing here. And it feels really satisfying. And I like that. I like, I, I like that even now, Erickson is giving me these little pieces of things coming together that kind of promise me that the chaos that's swirling around me in these two books, that many, many things that I do not understand, that that as I continue on, they're going to start coming together and it's going to feel satisfying and I'll be able to look back and say, ah, I, okay, now I can see what you were doing back then. Anyway, the book ends and all of part four was very um, engaging and exciting to read and devastating and I'm so sad. People that I really cared about died and it hurt really bad, a lot more than I thought it would. I was so overwhelmed and confused, but you know what? I knew that I was very emotionally invested in this book. I was extremely emotionally invested in this book, especially with Felicen and with my two fellas that can't remember anything and that remember everything. I love these characters so much. And as their stories progress and as we're getting more reveals about them and not just them, but tons of characters that, not tons, several characters that I feel like as I'm going on this journey with them, I'm really attaching to them. And, and it hurts, it hurts, it hurts. Now, resurrection has been a theme in this book and it has made sense and it works for me. So I'm just hanging on to hope for a couple of these. But when all these refugees get to where they're going and they can't make it in, and then they're all just slaughtered slowly, they slowly die, unarmed, defenseless. This ending hurt me. It depressed me. It's one that has, it's an ending that has haunted me for the last several days as I've finished this book. And it's one that I can't quite shake off just yet. It bummed me out big time. It was so hard, so hard to read. It was so hard to read this in a group of people that I have been traveling with and that I have grown to really care about. And I want to see, I want to see a good ending for them. And I, that's not what I get. And it, this has been a really interesting book because it's been very much a military fantasy, which is typically not the type of fantasy that I read, but I definitely have enjoyed it. I mean, I love the Burning series and, um, and there's definitely parts of Stormlight that are very military fantasy. So it, it, it's fine. It was very military, military fantasy, but also I really, this book reads to me very much like a tragedy, um, like Les Mis, like um, Wuthering Heights, like, De uh, I never did learn how to say that book's name. This, which I never learned how to say. It very much reads to me like a tragedy where it's like, there are no winners in war. Y you can't really root 
for any side. Um, and it's, it's just a brutally honest look of a brutal world. Um, I mean, it's not just the different storylines that were tragic. It's a lot of the world that's tragic too. You know, we, 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 we went through a lot of different places in this world and it seemed like each destination, each place that we stopped was just brutal. Um, whether it be, uh, a guy holding two eight-year-old kids against a wall trying to pull the leggings off of one of them or, um a naked kid running through the street and guards chasing after her and saying, we're not done with her yet. Um, walking up to a slaughtered town uh, where the men have been ripped apart and the women and children have been raped and strangled by the men's intestines. Um, a, a town of people that dig up the corpses of children to eat them. Uh, every, it, it seemed like it wasn't just the perspectives that were following it wasn't just the main crew, the main group of people that were deep in the perspectives of and, and deeply watching, but it seemed like every single step we took, we just saw more darkness in the world as a whole. And, um, yeah, it, I don't know, it, it read, it read like a tragedy to me because it just showed this, this tragic time in this tragic world where, um, there really just was no good side. And when we get to the end, it doesn't end um, like you think it will. It ends in a tragedy. And it's tough, man. It was so tough to read. This whole book was tough to read. It weighed really heavy on my heart. And I think it was meant to. I think it was really meant to show um, the tragedy of war. And I, I like to think which I, I, I'm not involved in the Malazan fandom. I don't really know anything. But I like to think that Erickson is um, not trying to write a tragedy of a series as a whole. As a whole, I feel like, I feel like I'm seeing pockets of hope that he's setting up um, that in future books, we're not going to just have like, misery porn. But what we're going to have is um, a brutally honest, tragic world and, and situations, um, but that we're going to see the hope rise up from it and the hope that peeks through it. I like to think that's what I, what it seems like he's setting up in this series. I definitely uh, don't read a lot of Grimdark and I mean, I do, I love Abercrombie. Um, I've read you know, Gentleman and Bastards and The Burning, which I think all of those things kind of, Abercrombie's probably grimdark, but The Burning and Gentleman and Bastards are kind of like grimdark scenes, um, but not grimdark themselves. And, and with, with Malazan, um, it's definitely darker than I'm used to reading, especially book two. Book one was dark too, but it was just different. It was just very different. Uh, with book two, it's a lot darker than I'm used to reading, and it hurt a lot more <laughs> than I tend to like uh, books to hurt me, but, um, I, I like to think that I can see what Erickson is, is setting up and doing, and that it's not gonna be a grim dark series, even though there's definitely grim darkness in the series. My goodness, there's grim dark scenes, but I like to think that even though this book felt grim dark, that that's not what the series is gonna be, that it's going to be something a lot, um, you know, not, not just like darkness and darkness and darkness, and that's all we revel in and that's all we have, but that he's going to give us a lot, a lot of hope, um, and a lot of light in the darkness. And I, this is very disjointed and I'm sorry, I'm speculating here, but I feel like I'm seeing threads of what he's setting up here, um, to really have some 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 things to say that I'm gonna enjoy reading. Uh, but this book was hard to read, <laughs> really hard to read. And it took me a long time to get through it just because it was it, it was just rough. Uh, Felice and Sori in particular just really um, hurt me a lot. And I think that Erickson did such an amazing job at writing uh, a child that's been really abused and, and to show her uh, just really honestly, I just really appreciate um, his not backing down 
on Felice and being a kid that's, uh, that's hurting and that's lashing out at the world and reacting to the world. And I think, I think her story is devastating and it, it was really, really hard for me to read. <clears throat> it was really hard for me to read Felice and story. Um, but I, I just appreciate Erickson's, um, honesty in writing her character and making her so flawed and so, um, bratty and so, uh, angry, um, because, because it just, it felt, it felt really real. I felt like I was reading from a real person reacting to really real events, reacting very raw and honestly to real events. And, um, Felice and Story was terribly hard to read, but I'm really glad I read it. I really appreciate, um, I really appreciate Erickson's ability to just write an honest character and then step back and let us, let us react to that character however, however we do. And the way I react to her is to, um, hurt with her really badly and to forgive her for a lot of the mistakes she makes because she's hurting so badly. And she's a character that I'm really, really excited to keep following and see what happens with her. Anyway, um, those are my very disjointed and muddled thoughts about Dead House Gates. I know I didn't even cover half of the major events and things that happened in the story, and I apologize for that. I'm just trying to hit highlights, and it's already this long. Um, I'm definitely going to continue on with book three. Uh, I, I do have, I, I, I spoke with Andy, um, as well as Brittany about, um, some of the really tough stuff in this book that was really hard for me to read, and they have kind of warned me about some of the stuff that's going to be happening in book three, which I'm super grateful for. Um, and... I don't know. I, I probably, I'm definitely not starting book three right away. I'm going to take a break. I'm going to breathe. I'm going to stop being so sad for a little bit. And, and then I'll come back around to book three. I'm looking forward to seeing what Erickson does with this world because I could be totally wrong in what I, in what he's going to do with it. I could be super wrong in the tone that he's taking and his intentions with where he's going with all this. But I, if I, if, if I have, even a, a little bit of a right idea about it. Um, I do look forward to seeing what he's gonna do. So there is my disjointed and muddled and bad review of Dead House Gates. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I, I will take a break, but I look forward to book three. Anyway, I post videos every Tuesday through Friday. I'll see you again soon.